Well, this lecture is titled Earth's Final Warning because that's basically what it is. It is chapter 14 in the book of Revelation which tells us what the final message to a world gone berserk is going to be. Revelation chapter 14 And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now we've discussed the hundred and forty-four thousand already, so I'm not going to go into detail as far as they are concerned, but they have the character of God impressed in their minds, the father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. A new song is a song of redemption. It is a song of delivery. It's something that you cannot understand unless you've had a conversion experience or a delivery experience. So this will be a song sung with gusto, which will be essential or part of the redeemed. And before the four beasts and the elders, and we've discussed them already as well, the covering cherubs and the 24 elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. Obviously, you cannot live someone else's experience. You cannot give someone else something which you have not experienced yourself. And so it is with the ten virgins at the end. There were ten virgins at the end, each one of them, was asleep. All of them had oil. All of them had a measure of the Holy Spirit. And then when the bridegroom came, they all woke up, but only half of them had enough oil to make it to the wedding feast. And the others didn't have enough oil. And so they asked those who had to give some of the oil, and they said, but we cannot give you any of our oil. And... Uh, some people say that's selfishness. Why didn't they give them some of the oil? I mean, what's the big deal? Well, you cannot share an experience. You cannot say, well, here's a part of my experience. Let me pour that, pour that into, your, into your lamp. You'll have to have had it yourself. You'll have to have that experience with Jesus Christ yourself. So everyone needs oil. Everyone needs this experience. And only if you've had the experience can you sing the song. It's the only way to sing this song. You need the experience. They, these are they which were not defiled with women. This always makes me sad, this statement, because I had a colleague once who left his wife because of that statement in the Bible. Can you believe it, how people think? literally left his wife because of that statement in the Bible. And uh, I said to him, you know, I think you have a wrong understanding about what a woman is in the Bible. This has nothing to do with physical contact between a man and a woman. This is something that deals with false worship. These are they who have not defiled themselves with apostate systems of worship. Now he was convinced it was not defiling himself literally with women. So I asked him one more question. I said, you've been married all these years. Isn't it a little bit late? <laughs> if that is what you believe. But uh, as far as I know, he still is away from his wife. But anyway, that's not what it means. Obvious it means. These are they which have not defiled themselves with apostate churches. For they are virgins. They are with Christ. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from amongst men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Why? Because they have perfect righteousness? Actually they have, but it's not theirs, it's imputed. 
and imparted righteousness. So, you know, none of us are virgins. None of us are virgins. But in Christ we are. Because in Him forgiveness is so total that you have no sin. And you are as though you have never sinned and therefore virgins in His eyes. What a wonderful blessing that is. And no guile was found in their mouths. When I think about myself, wow, can I qualify? I had a mind like a sewer all my life. In their mouth was found no guile. Can God just clean it up like that? Yes, He can. Yes, He can. For they are without fault before the throne. Why? Because He is a spotless lamb and stands in my stead. Isaiah chapter 48. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel. Israel, those who have wrestled with God and have overcome who said, I will not let you go, lest you bless me. Don't give up. Just hang in there. And then by faith, accept that it is so. And I'll come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth nor in righteousness, for they call themselves of a holy city and stay themselves upon the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts is his name. I have declared the former things from the beginning and they went forth out of my mouth and I showed them and they did them suddenly and I did them suddenly and they came to pass. So there are some people who declare that they are the lords, or they are the lords, they are the lords, but in actual fact they're relying on a system rather than relying on God. There's no value in relying on a system, none whatsoever. A system cannot save you. A church cannot save you. That doesn't mean that a, that a church cannot be a brotherhood and a sisterhood of God's people. But the church cannot save you. Only Jesus can save you. So this is the one that you have to trust. The one who declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth out of my mouth and I showed them and I did them suddenly and they came to pass. So you can test God by looking at the prophecies because I knew that thou art obstinate and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass, I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it to thee, lest thou should say, mine idol has done them, and my graven image and my molten image has commanded them. Isn't that fantastic? So what is prophecy there for? To remind us that God is in control, to remind us that He has the destiny of humanity in His hands, and He tells us ahead of time so that we see these things we may believe. In the same way, all the prophecy that we've dealt with, will it save us? No. But what it can do, it can teach us that God, after all, is worthy of our worship. And that's the only thing that prophecy can do. It cannot save you. Thou hast heard, Israel, see all this. Or thou hast heard, see all this, and will not ye declare it? I have showed ye new things from this time, even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. Thou art created now, and not from the beginning, even before the day, when thou heardest them not, lest thou should say, Behold, I knew them. Typical humanity. We think we can declare everything and explain everything rationally. This is not a rational world. In my own life, I came to a point where I said, well, this is not rational. I cannot cope with this. There must be something else. And then to find out that God had foretold all the events of history ahead of time so that I might believe that he exists. Wow, that's really something. You heard us it not. You knew us it not. Yet from that time... At that time, ear was not open, for I knew that thou wouldst deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. That's all we are. That's all we are. For my name's sake, I will defer mine anger, and for my praise, I will refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Hmm. Do you know... How often have you heard people that say, Christianity is a crutch? 
Have you heard that? I say, wow, Christianity is a crutch. You come and be a Christian. And here's my crutch. Have fun. Have fun with that crutch. I'll tell you, Christianity is no crutch. It's a furnace of affliction. And it is painful sometimes. Why? Because we have to change. It's about character building. We have to develop new characters in Jesus Christ. You know, today, the psychologists, if the young people come together, they go for counseling and the psychologists say, you are not compatible. You are, you have to, you are too different. You have to be the same. You have to have the same interests, the same this, the same that, and the same the other. And so, we are ruled by all these things. What does God do? He always puts opposites together. Have you noticed that? He always creates the worst case scenario. He does. You know, even in, if he chooses evangelists or whatever, he'll put a Martin Luther who's fire and brimstone together with a Melanchthon who's meek and mild and gentle. I have a dear friend, his name is Francois Duplessis. Small little man like that. Man, do I love that little man. He's absolutely the opposite of me. He always says, Walter, you knock him over, I'll pick him up. <laughs> He's sweet. <laughs> and he can do that, and he can put balm on. He says, you get into the showroom, I'll put on my overall, and I'll change the oil and put on the bandage afterwards. You know, that's how he works. So God puts together opposites. Now, this fire of affliction, who can change your character other than someone that you care about? Have you noticed that? If I go to work and there's a colleague there and he gives me a hard time, I say, bye, and I go home. He doesn't bother me. But what if my wife gives me a hard time? I can't say, bye. <laughs> so, something has to give, right? And so, Men normally have these bombastic characters, although times are changing, things are shifting around these days, but nevertheless, uh, who can change you? God uses people to change you, and he uses those close to you to change you. And the fire of affliction is to show you your character. Nobody can show you your character more than someone who's close to you. Nobody can do it. And if I'm mean to someone, and they don't care about me, I'm not related to them, they'll just ignore me and go away forever. If I'm mean to my wife, what then? Well, she can fight back, she can do that, but she can also be quiet and just have a tear. And that tear can be a lot worse than fighting back. Have you noticed that? Yes. So that really bugs you and worms you and grinds you and gets into your character and into your space. And eventually, well you get to the point, you better start changing because you, you cannot be like this anymore. You have to soften up. You have to be milder. You have to be this. So God uses people you love to help you change, however painful it is. And he says, you work at it. So he takes two people and he puts them in the fire of affliction. And it's the same in the church. If you ever thought the church was going to be a honky-dory place, oh no. This, these are brothers and sisters of a different kind. <laughs> oh yeah, you have all kinds of fish in this net. I'll tell you, these, these fish, serious fish, some of them have got heavy spines on them. Some of these animals in the ark are unbelievably sharp. Some like the rhinoceros can give you a bump that you are black and blue for six weeks. And it's one of those situations where you cannot walk away from it. I knew one man, shame he's dead now, an old man, and he was the most miserable son of a gun I've ever seen in my life. He was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Really he was. He was the worst thing that ever happened to me. He screamed at me. He, he did everything in his power to destroy everything I stood for. And he drove me nuts sometimes, you know. I thought I was going to modify him. But he was so much older than me, so I had to be respectful. And for all these years, God put this man into my life. And then he totally left everything. He 
totally lost everything. He even went together with a prostitute, left his wife. Everything went wrong. And then, just about four weeks ago, he was dying in the hospital. And I got called to his place, so I went to him. And I sat there next to his hospital bed, and I looked at him, and there he was, dying. They had already amputated pieces. He was diabetic, and he was on his last, last, last legs. And I sat there, and I looked at him, and I thought to myself, wow, this hard nut here. And he was still hard nut right there on that bed, on his deathbed. And I thought, what can I tell this man? And I said to him, you know what? You're the worst piece of meat that I ever met. You've been so mean to me, and I have given you one or two back. The two of us, we were both two rocks in a river. And we were bashing each other. And I said, you have been the very worst thing I've ever met. You. And you mean to tell me you're going to die and it's all for nothing? All for nothing? All this pain we went through for nothing? I want this pain to be worth it, and you are going to be in heaven. Do you understand me? That's how I spoke. I've never spoken to anyone like that on their deathbed before. <laughs> never. And he got quite contemplative. And then he said to me, yes, but it's too late. So I said, why is it too late? He says, I've messed up my entire life and I cannot make it right. So I said, join the club. We have all messed up our entire life and we cannot make it right. So why don't you take your massive failure and give it to Jesus Christ? Why don't you give him your failure? And then he will make it right. He says, well, how do I go back and fix it? I've left my wife, I'm living with this, I'm doing this, I'm doing the other. He said, what are you going to do? You, do you think you're going to get up? You know that you are on your last legs. You're not going to fix that. Give that failure to the Lord too. So he said, come back tomorrow. So I went back the next day, and we talked, and it was so nice. The tears started rolling down his eyes, and he gave his life to the Lord, and everything changed. He knew the truth. He said to me, you know, I hate it when one group thinks they have the truth. I hate it when they think they have the truth. What right have they got to have the truth? It's true, you know. Many people say, well, you Seventh-day Adventists, you think you have the truth. What a miserable bunch. And everybody else, what are they, got a lie? I said, you know, really, if you think about it, it's not a complicated doctrine. It's not a complicated doctrine at all. It's love Jesus for what he has done for you, give him the honor and the glory, and be obedient. Isn't it logical to keep the commandments of God? Yes, it's logical. Then where's your problem? That's the whole thing. Obedience and faith in his merit. That's it. That's the gospel in a nutshell. What's wrong with that? Are you satisfied with a changed gospel, it changed commandments, 10% discount in our denomination or whatever, you only have to keep nine, not one, we're a 10% discount, whatever. And he started thinking and he made his decision. And he died quite peacefully. And you know what, I had the privilege of actually doing the sermon at his burial. And everybody was there. His family was there, his wife was there, his girlfriend was there. They were all together and they were all hugging each other. Isn't that impossible? That's fire of affliction. So the Lord puts us in situations where we come into contact with those that we love and we can run away for, from it or we can allow it to change us. And that's our choice. And if we create tears and if we create pain, then what we can say is, the problem lies with me. And once I come to realize that the problem lies with me, then God can work with us. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he, I am the first, 
I also am the last. Mine hand also has laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. Acknowledge God. All ye assemble yourselves and hear which amongst you has declared these things. The Lord has loved him. He will do his pleasure on Babylon and his arm shall be on the Chaldeans. See, he now is comparing those who set up their own standards, who have their own religion, who don't need God. That's what the Chaldeans stood for. Bab El, another portal to God. I even, I have spoken, I have called him, I have brought him and he shall make his way prosperous. Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, and from the time that it was, there I am. And now the Lord God and his Spirit has sent me. Thus says the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldst go. And God knows best. Why not follow him? Oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments. You see, the whole gospel is here in this little piece. Then had thy peace been as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. God's commandments are an expression of his love. Thy seed also had been as the sand and the offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. His name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing declare ye, tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth, say ye, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Can you see the gospel there? Stay away from that which says, I can do it, I can reach God myself by my works, whatever the system is. If we don't have, the Lord has done this, he has redeemed me. We're not in the right religion. This is the gospel. If thou hast hearkened to my commandments, then thy peace had been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. It's a not as complicated doctrine. It's a very simple doctrine. We make it complicated. So what is the final warning to the world? It's embodied in the three angels' messages. And we find them in the book of Revelation, just subsequent to the verses that we've already read. The first angel's message. What is that all about? Well, let's read it. And I saw another angel, that's a messenger, flying in the midst of heaven, spreading his light across the whole heavenly divide, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Again over there, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, you have the seal of God. So the first angel's message says, we're living in judgment time. Pay attention to the word, worship God. Worship God. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. What do I have to do to tell the world that I acknowledge him as such? Simple. Just keep the Sabbath. Why? Because that's the heart of the Sabbath commandment. In six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and what them is, therefore he commanded you to keep holy the Sabbath day. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord took you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord commanded you to keep holy the Sabbath day. The Sabbath is a sign of creation. The Sabbath is a sign of redemption. He took us out of the land of sin and brought us into the fountain of his grace. So, as we were created by him, so we were redeemed by him. If you look at the Jewish system, there were seven annual Jewish feasts in type and anti-type. There was the Passover, Nisan 14. And that represented the crucifixion, because there the lamb was slain, and the blood of the lamb was painted on the doorposts 
And so we have to put the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts of our heart, and then the angel of the Lord that will come in judgment will pass us by. So if we accept our Passover that was sacrificed for us, then we acknowledge the crucifixion, the Lamb that died in our stead. The second Jewish feast was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Notice it was the very next day, Nisan 15. The unleavened bread, the bread without yeast, represents what? The body of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ in the grave. So he was crucified for us and he died for us, rested in the grave on the seventh day, and the very next day was Nisan 16, was the first of first the fruit, fruit uh, feast of first fruits, and that represents the resurrection. Jesus, the first fruits, he's the one who was raised from the dead, and the graves opened up, and people came out of their graves, says the Bible, and when he went into heaven, he took captives in his train. That is the resurrection. So in their annual feasts, the Jews were actually preempting the greatest event in history that would come. And the crucifixion, the death in the grave, and the resurrection was celebrated in their feasts. Then they had the Feast of Weeks, which was on Sivan 6. And that commemorated the same time period after the Passover that it took before the law was issued. And then came Pentecost. And it typified the giving of the law, of course, was a type, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, spreading the message abroad, was part of their annual feasts, a type of Pentecost. And then there were three other feasts. The Feast of Trumpets, Tishri 1. It heralded the judgment, Second Advent movement. A trumpets sounding, saying a great event is going to take place. Trumpets were sounded before the judgment, so it heralded the judgment, or the Second Advent movement, which says the time of his judgment has come. Then there was the Day of Atonement, Tishri 10. That's the pre-Advent judgment. Obviously, God is judging because when he comes again, his reward is is with him. Isn't that right? So if he comes with his reward, then obviously he's prejudged. So that judgment is taking place in heaven at the moment. So that was the Day of Atonement, and it represented this time when the high priest was in the Most Holy, and when he came out of there, then the sins were in type transferred to the goat, and he was led off in the wilderness. Note he didn't die, so he didn't become a sin bearer and, sh and a substitute. He was taken away, and the sins that had been confessed were removed from the sanctuary and eternally wiped off as though they had never existed. And the final feast they had was Tishri 15, the Feast of Tabernacles, where they made booths for themselves and celebrated in great happiness. That is the type of homegoing, the second advent. So in the annual Jewish feasts, you had the whole gospel story embodied. The Day of Atonement is the annual cleansing of the earthly sanctuary. So there the high priest went in with the blood and he officiated in the most holy. And he made atonement for the entire sanctuary coming out, cleansing the sanctuary of the record of sin. So the Day of Atonement was a day of judgment. The Day of Judgment had come. The high priest took blood and he went into the Most Holy and he sprinkled it and he made atonement for the sanctuary and the uncleanness of the people. Now what is the standard of judgment? James tells us. James chapter 1, verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, 
this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 2 verse 12, So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Wonderful name for it, the law of liberty. The law sets you free. It's not a law of bondage. If everybody had to keep the law on this planet, wouldn't we all be free? Yes or no? Absolutely. There's logic in it. Your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the sea had everybody kept the law. What is sin? Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3 verse 4. That's what sin is. So if you want to have a relationship of obedience, well, you have to keep the law of God. Where no law is, there is no transgression, Romans 4.15. So there must have been a law from the beginning, yes or no? Otherwise there would have been no transgression. For the wages of sin is death. But what is the little verse that comes thereafter? Ah, but the gift of God is eternal life. Isn't that so? through his righteousness. So this is the full gospel. Wages of sin, death. Gift of God, eternal life in, in, in Christ Jesus. Now wages is something that you get for what you do. Isn't that right? So if you choose to break the law of God, the consequence is death. The solution to that, since we all did that, is salvation by faith through grace. Isn't that right? We are all saved by grace. Does that mean we must leave this sentence out that we should not sin? Sin separates from God. Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Isaiah 59 verse 2. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's the whole verse. This is an everlasting gospel. Sin kills. Life is in Christ. So, accept life in Christ and stop sinning. Is that biblical? What did Jesus say to the woman caught in adultery? Yes, exactly. He says, where are your accusers? And she answers, I don't know, Lord, they have left. And he says, neither do I condemn you. That's grace. Go and sin no more. What is that? Obedience. That's the everlasting gospel. But today the world has modified the everlasting gospel. They always leave one arm, one leg of it out. You have to have the full story. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Romans 6, 14 and 15. Is the law done away with because we are under grace? Should we now break the law because we are under grace? No. Remember that quote from the charismatic churches that I read where it said that if you keep the law of God, you haven't got the Holy Spirit? Wow. What kind of gospel is the world teaching today? Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3, 19 and 20. So, I'm not saved by my good works, I'm saved because I have a Savior. Absolutely, that's the only reason why I'm saved. But the law tells me what's right and wrong, and therefore I know what's right and wrong, and I can distinguish. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we established the law, Romans 3, verse 31. So in other words, we should be doers of the law, not to save ourselves, but because we love the Lord. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good, Romans 7, 12. There's no such thing as we don't have to keep the law of God. Four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. People say, you know, they repeat each other. They don't. 
They augment each other, yes, but they don't repeat each other. In Matthew, Christ is depicted as the king. In Mark, Christ is depicted as the servant. In Luke, Christ is depicted as fully man. In John, he's depicted as fully divine. All of it in one. If we want to represent the everlasting gospel, we have to put law and grace into perspective, and we have to serve Jesus as king, we have to emulate him as servants. He was a man. He died for us so that he can feel our humanity and share in our weaknesses, and we must acknowledge him as God. There's nothing less. Cannot demote him. The five books of Moses, Genesis, the book of origins, the fall and the promise of redemption. Exodus, Christ our sanctuary. He's the one who leads us. The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Leviticus, Christ our sacrifice. Numbers, Christ our guide. Deuteronomy, Christ our reward. The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. That's the everlasting gospel. Don't you think the world has missed out somewhere along the line? No, some people say we only need the New Testament. They say, well, why bother carrying such a heavy book? Get a nice pair of scissors and cut the rest off. Throw it away if you don't need it anymore. No, the Old Testament and the New Testament, they all talk about Jesus. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily, verily, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle will shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. The everlasting gospel must be preached. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Luke 16, verse 17. Not one iota of the law is going to disappear. Even the NIV has it right. This is love for God, to obey his commands. It would be better if they had commandments, like the King James has it. And his commands, commandments, are not burdensome. 1 John 5, verse 3. His commandments are not burdensome. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 9. So the world has de-emphasized obedience and overemphasized salvation by grace. Salvation by grace is the primary. There is no doubt about it, because without that we are all lost. But without obedience, we won't get there either. So the law of God has been done away with, then why do you find it in the New Testament? This is the New Testament. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4.10, Revelation 19.10. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. 1 John 5.21, Acts 17.29. That the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. 1 Timothy 6.1. The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Mark 2, 27, 28, Hebrews 4, 4. Honor thy father and thy mother, Matthew 19, 19, Ephesians 6, 1, 3. Thou shalt not kill, Romans 13, 9, James 2, 11. Thou shalt not commit adultery, Matthew 19, 18. Thou shalt not steal, Romans 13, 9, Ephesians 4, 20. Thou shalt not bear false witness, Romans 13, 9. Thou shalt not covet, Romans 7, 7. So you're in trouble if you're saying the law has been done away with in the New Testament, because there it is, in the New Testament. You're in big trouble. So we cannot eliminate the law of God. The tabernacle was pitched in the midst of the people, Jesus in the midst of his people. That's what it stands for. The everlasting gospel, it has never ever changed. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, it was brought to the high priest, it died instead of the sinner, Every Jew in the past was saved by the blood of the Lamb. There's no such thing as the Jews were under law and we are under grace. Then how come a Jew had to bring a lamb? Because he was under grace. Because he was under grace, that's why. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. John 1, 29. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2 verse 9. I was speaking to a Muslim once, 
And he said to me, you Christians have an easy life. And I said, why? He says, you Christians, you just do whatever you like, you sin, and then you say, eh, forgive me, and it's done, and you sin some more. We can't do that. I said, yeah, that's what Christianity has become, you're right. I actually stand ashamed before you that that is a fact. Is that real Christianity? Did Christ die so that we can continue sinning? I don't think so. True Christianity is acknowledging the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and asking him to clean up our act. Amen. To get off our high horse and to acknowledge our weakness and our sin and to cling to the advocate. It's the only hope we have. Do you know how fortunate we are that the great judge of the universe also happens to be our advocate? Can you imagine anything nicer than that? The judge who's going to judge you is also your advocate. The judge says, you know, I think you are guilty of this. And then the same judge says, yes, but I paid the price. Wow. But did you then say thank you, thank you, and love the Savior so much that you stopped doing what you did before? If you were given a reprieve in a prison cell for some wicked deed that you had done, would it be right to say, well, now I'm free to go and do it again and again? Some actually do that, you know. Or would it be better to say, I have, wow, I've been given a reprieve, I will never do that again. Which one would be the better of the two options? Obviously the latter. He was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 9. I was once talking to a minister and he said to me, the law has been done away with. You're a legalist. I said, wow. Well, do you mind if I take your wife home with me tonight? <laughs> that might be a bit harsh. Of course, my wife was with me, so I could say that. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, then he said, no, of course not. I said, well, what if I killed one of you? of you, would that be okay? Or how about if I took your car? Or how about, you know, and I went through the Ten Commandments. Now they're still there. Which one is the problem? The Sabbath is the problem, not the other nine. But because there is no argument, they have to sometimes get rid of it all to get rid of the one. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the crux of the first angel's message. We're living in judgment time. There's an everlasting gospel. It has never changed. We have nullified it. We have cauterized it. We have cut it into half. We must go back to the original. And we must acknowledge the one who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's what we have to do. That's the first angel, and then followed a second angel. The second angel's message is a frightening message. You see, if you reject the message of the first angel, then you are rejecting light. And if you reject light, eventually you will sit where? In darkness. So what does the second angel's message say? And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 14.8. That's the second angel's message. It's a powerful message. And this is a message that must go to the entire world. So what point is there if I go to the world and I say to them, world, Babylon is fallen. Would that make any difference? 
Wouldn't I have to explain to someone what Babylon is before I can tell them that it's fallen? Yes or no? Absolutely. If people don't know what Babylon is, then what's the point of giving this message? So who is Babylon? You have to go to ancient Babylon to find out what Babylon is. What was Babylon? Babylon was a religious system that was very, very uh, well, attractive to the Israelites. And they went and chose that religion nine times out of ten over their own religion. They kept on going back to Babylon. Why? Because it's so much more comfortable to have your own way to God rather than listen to his requirements. The wine of Babylon? Well, what is the wine of Babylon? The wine of Babylon is false doctrine. Two selected messages, 68.2. The wine of Babylon is the exalting of the false and spurious Sabbath above the Sabbath which the Lord Jehovah has blessed and sanctified for the use of man. Also the immortality of the soul. These kindred heresies and the rejection of the truth convert the church into Babylon. Kings, merchants, rulers, religious teachers are all in corrupt harmony. Yes, today the church is following or the, the rulers of the world are following the church. Revelation 16, 13, and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, 13 and 14. Scary. All right. And in actual fact, we're talking about the Babylon system. It consists of three components. And they're run by unclean spirits, like frogs. Frogs were one of the plagues in Egypt because frogs were one of the were deities in the Egyptian system. So here they are, and they're out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Those three components. And they're spirits of devils, working miracles. Counteracting that, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. Two messages. What are these messengers? And who is this woman Babylon that has the whole world worshipping at its feet? So mystic Babylon has these three components, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we've dealt with them in quite some detail in these lectures. Here's a bronze frog, and uh, this is in Japan, where they have the worship of their deity, which is father, mother, child, just like the Isis-Osiris system. And they still worship these frogs on the outside. So don't think this worship system is over. It's the ancient old Babylonian system of worship. Bronze frog combined the sun with water, symbolizing fertility. So UNESCO tells us. They should know. What is the dragon? Well, the dragon is identified in the Bible as Satan, that old serpent. So everything that deals with spiritism, where demonic forces directly orchestrate mankind, is part of the dragon system. So that would include, for example, witchcraft. Does witchcraft lead astray? But witchcraft, what has that got to do with the church? What if the church starts saying we must hold seances, as the Church of England did? Doesn't witchcraft then become part of the church? Doesn't the Babylonian worship system creep into the church? Who are these priests of Rome? The wandering bishops who deal with the occult and run the scenes behind the New Age movement? What about world philosophy, Ayn Rand? The virtue of selfishness. Is there virtue in selfishness? No, but in human thinking... There is virtue in selfishness. In fact, Robert Schuller teaches self-esteem is what you really need, not God-esteem, self-esteem. 
I thought he must increase, I must decrease. Did you know something which is a little secret? And that is that truth and error are like this. They are like this. Do you know if you are willing to surrender your self-esteem to Christ, you actually increase in, est in esteem? It's amazing, but it's a fact. Think about it. Because you have the God of the universe acknowledging you as his child. You become, become a, a son or a daughter of the Most High, a prince to sit on a throne together with him. Wow. If that isn't something, then what is? But you have to learn humility from him in order to qualify. Here, we're learning something else. What about what we heard from this lovely lady, J.C. Knight? You are God. Forget about Jesus Christ. He's just one of the crowd. Spiritism in all its forms, where man sets himself up as a god to be worshipped. So we have all the god kings, the Dalai Lamas, all these people, in the worship systems of the world. And these worship systems are all coming together in the United Nations to form one big united religion. And we have to acknowledge the same deity behind them all. I have a problem with that. How can I acknowledge a deity that exalts self if I worship a deity that stands for humility. The two are incompatible. But all of these are coming together into one super system. Bhagwan Sri, worshipped as a human being. Does it really give you self-esteem? It robs you of your dignity. Or Maitreya, as he appeared in Nairobi. And people worshipping him as Jesus Christ. We are told in the churches today that Harry Potter is just great. And kids dress up as Harry Potter to come and practice his values in the church. This is witchcraft. So has the church not incorporated witchcraft in its systems? Yes or no? At least tolerated it. There are many, many in the church who are horrified as they see what is happening. And I presume God is permitting it to get worse and worse and worse and worse. So they can wake up and see what has become of the church. The church has become Babylon by allowing dragon worship into its very midst. What about modern, modern spiritualism with the Fox sisters? There they are. Started with a rapping, tap, 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 tap. Eventually it went into full-blown seances and demonic worship. Well, we saw that the founding fathers of the modern Christian movements, the psychic research organizations, where the great bishops, Westcott, Hort, all of these that actually rewrote the Bible for us, if you like, that they had their ghost societies and communicated with spirits. Isn't that spiritualism in the church? Spiritualism says that the dead know more than the living, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, Genesis 3, verse 4. In this case, as in many other Bible passages, the devil told the truth and the Lord is in error. E.W. Sprague, a spiritualist. Straight out, they don't mince words. The fundamental principle of spiritism is that the human beings survive bodily death, and that occasionally, under conditions not yet fully understood, we can communicate with those who have gone before. J. Arthur Hill, Spiritism, History, Phenomena, and Doctrine, page 25. This is spiritism in the world. The Bible says, when you die, you're dead. Your only hope is the resurrection. That's your only hope. Spiritism claims the dead communicate. There is no death in the graveyard. I have frequent talks with the dead. I cannot doubt that the people live after death, for I frequently talk with them. So Oliver Lodge said that. Well, modern kings do it all over the place. Prince Charles has regular sessions with Mount Batten, who's been dead for a very long time, and he's the head, official head of the Church of England. 
Is there spiritism in the church, yes or no? Absolutely there's spiritism in the church. Progressive thinker, May 18, 1929, what spiritualism is and does, it removes all fear of death, which is really the portal to the spirit world. It teaches that death is not a cessation of life, but a mere change of condition. Spiritualism is God's message to mortals declaring that there is no death. What does that do with God? Makes him a what? Makes him a liar, that's right. That all who have passed on still live, that there is hope in the life beyond for the most sinful, that every soul will progress through the ages to heights sublime and glorious where God is love and love is God. The world out there is living a lie. I have spiritualistic seance information, tapes if you like, of a session with Cecil John Rhodes. Of course he's dead, but he speaks to the spiritist and he explains who the hierarchy is in the heaven, on the other side, and the most wicked people on this earth, according to this spiritualistic seance, are higher than Jesus Christ on the other side. Adolf Hitler, for example, is higher on the other side than Jesus Christ, because he had more experience here on earth that he gained. Can you believe that? Well, these are terrible, terrible doctrines, doctrines of devils. Being propagated in churches because virtually all churches today propagate this doctrine of continued life. Who did Alice A. Bailey speak to when she spoke to Dwalkul? If the dead are waiting for the resurrection, then who did she speak to? Who is Dwalkul? He's a demon. That's what he is. Here's the official website of the Church of Satan. This man over here, Anton LaVey. Do they have good doctrines? Yes. But the church of Satan is a recognized church in the world, standing side by side with the other churches in a community of all the churches. What has light and darkness got in common? Has the world gone mad? Is the high priest of Satanism, he's supposedly responsible for I don't know how many sacrifices of humans and uh, satanic news on the march. What does the satanic Bible say? 1969, Anton LaVey, the founder. Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. Do you know what? The kingdom of heaven is made of such as these. Go ye into the highways and byways, and go and fetch the lame and the crippled and the this and the that. How often we despise them. No, no, no. Love them. Take them into the arms of the church because they will make up the kingdom of heaven. Let Satan laugh at our weaknesses and at our crippled minds and at our crippled bodies. He ain't seen nothing yet wait till they are transformed and receive that which God has in store for us. He will still be judged by them. So, Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better, more often worse than those that walk on all fours, who because of his divine, spiritual, and intellectual development has become the most vicious animal. So we're gods. Same teaching. Satan represents all of the so-called sins as they all lead to physical, mental, and emotional gratification. And Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had as he has kept it in business all these years. That's Anton LaVey's Bible. Now if you look at it, how much of this has actually slipped into church doctrines today? Surprising, frightful amount. The all-seeing eye of Lucifer. Well, there are some interesting things here. The wedge of the eye, this little thing in the middle, the eye of Lucifer. Did you know that that was the first little computer game in the world? Pac-Man. Remember that? Gobbled up everything. Yeah, interesting. Oh. 
So spiritism, the dragon component, is everything that has to do with demonic activity. Dressed up sometimes as churchy, sometimes as pure demonic, Satanism, and all are welcome in the folds of Babylon. What about the beast? Well, that's Catholicism. Unfortunately, that's what the Bible teaches. All the attributes of the papacy apply to the beast power. He is the one who has the sign of Horus, and the world religion will be subject to him. He's all things to all men. There he receives the tilak in Hinduism. There he kisses the Quran. We've dealt with these things. A dead Christ cannot communicate. A body of Christ as God, literally making God from a morsel of bread. Well, can he save you? No. Believe me, I tried to talk to him. He doesn't answer. He doesn't answer. And substituting Mary, this is the coat of arms of the Vatican, the dragon on the papal crest in the Vatican Museum, Vatis, Divina, Khan, Serpent, Vatican, Divining Serpent. That's what it means. So we follow the beast power, we're in trouble. Revelation 13, 4, and they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with them. So if we acknowledge Rome as the spiritual head of the churches, well, then we are acknowledging the leadership of Babylon rather than the leadership of Jesus Christ. At what then do the Jesuits aim? According to them, they only seek the greater glory of God, but if you examine the facts, you will find that they aim at universal dominion alone. They have rendered themselves indispensable to the Pope, who without them could not exist because Catholicism is identified with them. They have rendered themselves indispensable to governance, hold revolutions in their hand, and in this way, either under one name or another, it is they who rule the world. It's just a fact. All these revolutions we spoke about, all this death and all this mayhem under their control so that by creating chaos they can create the world order that they want and we have to be subject to them. So that is the other component of Babylon. Who's the false prophet? That's very sad. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. This was another Christian system. Spoke like a dragon. And we discussed this in Revelation 13. This was the Protestant United States coming up and taking power and making an image unto the beast. Becoming like it. And Protestantism, which is supposed to stand for freedom and righteousness, is actually today masonry in disguise. Statue of Liberty, it's Masonic. A holy alliance, which is an unholy alliance. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. And so Rome would bound the Protestant churches, adopted beast characteristics. And the Church of England here changed its face and became like the beast. We discussed all that. And we had a look at all their teachings and what they are teaching and how it's totally contrary to the Bible. What Shula said, what the Bible said, all these things. How Shula said, and we can pray, our Father in heaven, honorable is our name. To be born again means that we must be changed from a negative to a positive self-image. A religion based on self, a religion based on worldly values, a religion honoring mankind to the level of deity, this is sin. This is sin and needs to be called by its right name whether Billy Graham endorses it or not. The Bible and the Bible alone. Whether he sits with the Pope or not, he has endorsed it. What about the charismatic movement? It says, when he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. Is this still Christianity? I don't think so. Promise Keepers, Kenneth Hagen Magazine, 
obelisks, and we have a form of godliness denying the power thereof. It's very sad. Or Benny Hinn, which says, I am, I am, I am, I am. Don't say I have, say I am. You are everything he was and everything he is and ever shall be. Is that Christianity? I don't think so. So what is this? This is false prophecy. This is false preaching. This is a lie. And it has to be exposed. And so the dragon component in the churches and the beast component in the churches and the false prophet component in the churches has to be exposed for what it is. And the message goes to the world, Babylon is not what it seems. It's fallen. It's fallen. And then follows another angel. Now, do you think the churches will accept this rebuke, yes or no? No, they won't accept it. Will individuals accept it? Thank God for that, or else all preaching would be in vain. The third angel's message, what does that say? Revelation 14, 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive the mark, his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Wow! Never has a message like that gone out from God. This is powerful stuff. And we've dealt with this actually already, because we've dealt with the mark in the forehead and in the hand when we dealt with Revelation 13. So I point you to that. So what was it? What was it all about? The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture, without mercy this time, total destruction, into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angel and in the presence of the Lamb. What does that mean? Two lectures coming up on that storm. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. What does that mean? And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. What does that mean? What is this forever and ever and ever and ever? Well, it'll take two lectures to clarify it. The last two. And then we'll have eternal peace after that. Revelation 14, 9 to 10. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in the is, and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 28. Remember that it is a sign between me Ot, and the Lord that he rested on the seventh day, and he was refreshed, and the sign meant a mark. So God has a mark, it is the Sabbath, we must understand God's mark, his sign, his seal. We went through this in Revelation chapter 13. And the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with a finger of God. They were not to be messed with. Deuteronomy 9 verse 10. So God's seal, God's mark is in the heart of his law. It's the Sabbath. And it gives authority, as we have said, to the whole law. Now, are we saved by keeping the law? No, let's get this quite clear. But without keeping the law, will we be saved? No. See, I always ask the counter question as well. Now the point is this. If we're not saved by keeping the law, then how are we saved? By grace. Grace saves us. 100%. Grace saves us. We are saved by grace. So, if I now keep the law... Well, what am I acknowledging by keeping the law? I'm acknowledging a higher authority than myself. Is that correct? If I keep the law, I am acknowledging a higher power than myself. And if I keep it exactly like he said, I'm acknowledging his authority. Is that correct? So whose righteousness am I acknowledging? Jesus's. So don't think that by saying keep the law... You are legalistic. No. In actual fact, by keeping the law, if you do it right, you are propagating righteousness by faith. 
because you are acknowledging his superiority in your life, you are acknowledging your dependence upon him, and you come in line with his wishes because you are acknowledging his fullness of understanding. Does that make sense? So, by not accepting man's laws, but accepting God's laws, I acknowledge my dependence upon him, and I accept his righteousness by faith. So, the mark of the beast message involves righteousness by faith, and obedience as a consequence. As simple as that. But the Lord, Creator, heaven and earth, that's His stamp, His name, His title, His territory. I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. So where does your righteousness come from? From Him, not from me. This is righteousness by faith. So, the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. Absolutely. It could be construed as legalism if you wanted to. But in actual fact, what you are doing by keeping the law, if you understand it correctly, is acknowledging a higher power. And it will be if you will listen carefully to my commandments which I command you today to take heed to yourselves that your heart may not be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Therefore you shall lay up these my words in your hearts and in your souls and bind them for a sign upon your hand so that they may be frontlets between your eyes. John, Deuteronomy 11, 13, 20. So we act accordingly, we think accordingly. And the mark of the beast? Sunday is our mark of authority. Well, they say it themselves. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of the Sabbath observant is proof of that fact. Catholic record, September 1, 23. She took the pagan Sunday, she made it the Christian Sunday. The pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balda, became the Christian Sunday, sacred to, to Jesus. And she acknowledges it. She says, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power. So it's not a question so much of a day as it is of authority. If I obey this system, I am exalting human laws, and basically I'm saying I'm getting my sanctification from whom? From the church. And that's what she wants. No church can give me sanctification, not even the one that I'm in. No church can give me sanctification. Only Jesus Christ can give me sanctification. That's it. No one else. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Father Enright, American Sentinel. They're pretty arrogant about it. Pretty arrogant about it. So, who do I acknowledge? The earthly powers or the heavenly powers? That's the question. Choose the whom you want to acknowledge. God or man? The power of sanctification through God or the power of sanctification through man, which leads to death? Because how can man save you? Pope Pius, 1566, commanded the Council of Trent, it pleased the Church of God that the religious celebration of the Sabbath day should be transferred to the Lord's Day. Catechismus Romanos. And unfortunately, all the world wanders after the beast. So the third angel's message is, do not acknowledge man's law superior to God's law. The test will be the Sabbath. Might they put a microchip into your hand? Maybe. Maybe to control your buying and selling. But a chip is not your character of allegiance. What your character of allegiance is, is obedience to God's commandments. They must be on your forehead and on your hand. The Catholic Church is happy if it's on your hand or your forehead. There's a subtle difference there. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, bind it as frontlets between your eyes and your hand. But the mark of the beast is in the forehead or the hand. Why that subtle difference? 
Because the Catholic Church is satisfied if you keep it because you are convinced it's right, but it's also satisfied if you do it because you have to, without acknowledging anything. Just being obedient is good enough. Well, it's not good enough. You be obedient to God. He has the patience of the saints. He are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14. Well, this message will become even more powerful when in Revelation 18, after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon is fallen! Babylon is fallen! Now look what has happened. She has become a habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Well, if you reject God, well, then you get demons. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornications, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich, etc., etc., etc. And I heard another voice saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plague. So God is going to call his people out of Babylon. They have to come out. They have to see that an earthly system has been built up which does not lead to righteousness and have no fellowship with the unfruitful de works of darkness, but rather expose them. Ephesians 5 verse 11. That's the last message of warning to the world. It's a tough message. It's a very tough message and a very unpopular message. And then there will be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. When this message finishes up, this planet's not going to look the same anymore. And he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalms 91 verse 1. If you choose the Lord, you have nothing to fear. He'll take care of you. He has promised to do so. He didn't promise you a rose garden. At least he's not a liar. At least he didn't promise you utopia and then doesn't deliver. He says, it's going to be tough. But I'll take care of you. And then a decree will go out. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Probation closes. The decision has been made. And then, after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven with great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. God's people will come out of Babylon. And I heard a voice from heaven, Revelation 14, 13 and 14, saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. <laughs> Strange sentence. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud sat one, like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. What's a sickle for? Harvest. Time of harvest. Well, if you die, well, that's a blessing in a way. Because the Lord will raise you up. Nothing to fear. If you're alive, that's a blessing because you'll see him coming. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13. It's the very next act. This is the final message of warning to a world. Followed by the coming of Christ. For the great day of his wrath has come and who will be able to stand? Well, we'll have to answer that question. Revelation 6, 17. And we'll look at it in detail as we go into another lecture. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, and for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in the sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So there's a redemptive reaping. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in the sharp sickle and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. So there's a first harvest 
and now there's a second harvest. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse's bridles <coughs> by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. What does all this mean? Well, wine is doctrine. And here is a doctrine of the earth as opposed to the heavenly doctrine. And this doctrine will come up and bury the horses. What did the horse stand for? The gospel herald. So this gospel herald that was spread from this earth and was a lie because it was earthly and left Jesus Christ out will bury in its own in, be buried in its own iniquity. And it will disappear forever. So the choice is between the one system or the other. We either go with Christ when he comes or we form part of the other harvest. The choice is ours. And that final message of warning, as hard as it sounds, is a message of love because it calls us to acknowledge Jesus. Think of the simplicity of it. My people, he's basically saying, I love you. It is time for judgment to come. Why don't you leave the evil philosophies of this earth? Why do you want to be steeped in evolution and all these philosophies? Why don't you acknowledge me as your creator and your redeemer? Why do you want to follow philosophies that exalt the human and denigrate the divine? Why don't you want to look up for your salvation then look down? Don't you want to obey me and my precepts so that it may be well with you? Don't you want to acknowledge me because I am the one who sanctifies you and makes you whole and makes you sons and daughters of the Most High? That's the message. Isn't it a nice message? It's a sweet call from the Lord above saying, come my children, why would you be lost? And you can listen or you can reject. That's the final message to this world. It's tough, but I believe it's true. Amen.